Okay, good morning everyone and we are now officially broadcasting live on YouTube. So thank you so much for participating and attending in our first sustainability lecture. Um, this will be um, a monthly event and I hope that I'll see you all as well on the upcoming lectures. To start us off, to give us an overview on what uh, this is all about, I'd like to call the Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation of De La Salle University, Manila, Professor Raymond Tan. Thank you very much, Dr. Davisa. Uh, colleagues, if you'll allow me to share my screen just to give a brief overview of the lecture series. All right, good morning once again. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Sustainability Lecture Series. And if you happen to not be in the Philippines, but in some other time zone, good evening, good afternoon. This lecture series is being hosted by De La Salle University, which is an institution that uh, was founded 110 years ago. And uh, it's not well known to the public, but we actually just became a university in 1975, which means that we're looking forward in the next few years to our 50th year as a university. And it's within the past five decades that massive investments were made in human resources, especially and capacity to do research. And what has happened is uh, we've actually started to see the dividends in the past decade, which was a period of unprecedented growth in our research output and research capability. To the extent that the university scaled to population is now the most research intensive university in the Philippines with significant international standing. So I'd invite you all to visit our website via the QR code on the screen. This lecture series is being conducted in cooperation with the International Association of La Salle Universities. This is a network of kindred institutions which have the same roots in France several centuries ago. And of course, we're divided by large distances, but we are trying to reach out and form a more cohesive community in response to pressing global issues. Ialu is represented here this morning by Dr. Carmelita Quebenco who is uh, DLSU's representative to this network in the research committee. This lecture series is inspired by two very significant and influential documents that came out in the middle of the previous decade. Number one, of course, is the famous encyclical of the current Pope, Pope Francis, uh, the Laudato Si document, which outlined the concern of the Catholic Church about unsustainable practices and lifestyles. And uh, because there are so many continents and countries which are predominantly Catholic, there's significant influence in a religious leader speaking out about actual sustainability issues. On the secular side, of course, the United Nations came up with the Sustainable Development Goals with 17 uh, sub-goals that represent developmental targets for the year 2030. And in fact, these sustainable development goals have been adopted by many countries, including the Philippines, as a roadmap to guide national planning towards development. So these two have likewise been examined by top leadership at De La Salle University. Our mission vision was recast and updated and of course, we've taken up the challenge as a leading learner-centered and research university to make significant contributions to sustainable development. And thus, we have the genesis, if you will, of the sustainability lecture series. After a difficult 2020, which really caused plenty of uh, chaos in higher education throughout the world, we decided to get together and uh, start 2021 on the right foot. And the plan is to hold 12 lectures 
on the last Wednesday of each month at roughly the same time. The plan is to live stream via Zoom as we're doing now, but we do realize there will be time zone issues, for instance, uh, for our colleagues who are in North and South America, this would be early evening, so it's convenient. But if you happen to be somewhere in between in the Middle East and Africa and Europe, then it's a bit inconvenient. So all the lectures will be recorded and available for non-synchronous viewing on YouTube. And uh, that should alleviate some of the problems that we will encounter with time zone issues. We envision the lecture series to tackle diverse topics. The only common theme would be sustainable development. And we certainly would like to hear from a wide range of uh, scholars and experts via lectures and panel discussions on different aspects of sustainable development. And it's not just environmental issues. These would include social, political, economic, and other issues that are that touch upon the common goal of sustainable development. So in the future, we certainly will welcome resource persons from the IALU network. And uh, our colleague from the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research has uh, gracefully accepted my request for him to host this lecture series throughout the year. So with that, I'd just uh, give the floor to my colleague, Professor Dr. Alvin Kolaba, head of the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research, to give a few brief remarks about this, the inaugural lecture of the series. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Raymond Tan. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure uh, for the uh, Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development uh, Research of the Alasal University in Manila, Philippines, uh, to host uh, this uh, sustainability lecture a series uh, initiated by the IALU uh, member institutions. Uh, I would like first to greet the uh, Chancellor Emeritus, uh, Carmelita Kibenko, who represents the IALU uh, institutions. And of course, my colleague here, our host, uh, Professor Kathleen Aviso. The uh, Center for Engineering Sustainable Development Research has been established back in 2003 by a former secretary. At that time, uh, he was our faculty at the uh, Gokongwe College of Engineering. Uh, former Secretary of DOST, uh, Philemon A. Oriate Jr., and myself, and primarily to uh, provide uh, a venue for scholars and academics uh, to do particular studies that would address the many problems uh, related to sustainable uh, development. And uh, the College of Engineering uh, faculty responded uh, by way of uh, undertaking significant uh, studies that cover from uh, environmental issues to energy issues, uh, even transport and uh, disaster uh, and resilience and other uh, sustainability related you know, uh, uh, problems. In fact, we also did socioeconomic studies in this uh, particular area. And to date, uh, we are very proud that over 1,600 publications uh, with Scopus have been uh, published by uh, our top uh, scholars and scientists uh, at the center. Uh, for this particular uh, uh, maiden um, uh, lecture, we have one of our prominent uh, scientists in the center. Professor uh, Anthony Chu. He is a full professor and university fellow at the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department of De La Salle University, Manila. Professor Chu is a member of the United Nations International Resource Panel, advisory member of the LCVA Atlas Sustainable Award, and editor-in-chief of the LCVA Cleaner and Responsible Consumption Journal. He has been working in Sustainable Consumption and Production, or SCP, since its transition from cleaner production 
with more than 100 articles and manuals published. This presentation is an excerpt of his December 2020 background uh, paper at the 10th Regional 3R and Circular Economy Forum of the United Nations Center for Regional Development to speak on sustainable consumption and production. This is SDG 12. In response to the pandemic impact, let us welcome Professor Anthony Chu. Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you, Raymond. And uh, thank you, Kay, for uh, we have been working together as a team for the last uh, 10, 15, and 20 and 25 years, uh, respectively, uh, according to our <laughs> uh, collaboration since our acquaintance. Um, good morning, everyone from uh, Manila. And of course, good evening to our colleague from uh, uh, Brazil, uh, Lasallian schools there, and many other uh, Lasallian colleagues in the different regions. Uh, allow me to share my screen. Okay, can I share my screen? Can you give me the authority, please? Yes, yes, you're already a co-host, so you can share your screen. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I think my, my PowerPoint is already uh, is already up there. In the, yes, we can see uh, it now. Uh, okay, thank you. Let me remove this uh, bar up there. Okay, control bar, so it will cover. All right. So uh, this morning, uh, my topic is sustainable consumption and production. So that is SDG 12 uh, in response to the pandemic impact. And I understand very well that uh, I'm very happy to accept this uh, challenge to, to deliver the first uh, lecture uh, series. Uh, as I understand that this is uh, to be joined by my, uh, all my Lasallian colleagues worldwide. Um, so I call it a Lasallian Sustainability Lecture Series rather than just DLSU. Uh, I hope that many of uh, looking forward to listen to the uh, to the presentation of other Lasallian colleagues now from the other uh, universities worldwide. I've been very proud in all my uh, work, uh, this, uh, presentation worldwide uh, always to present to the world that uh, we have uh, more than. Uh, the LaSalle University or LaSalle School is uh, present in uh, more than 70 or 80 countries worldwide. So uh, I, I, I really look forward to, to, to see the colleagues uh, at this pandemic time since I can no longer travel and visit you in various uh, countries. <clears throat> All right, so my, uh, my outline, uh, just uh, Thought, thinking about the outline last uh, evening when I was preparing or reorganizing this PowerPoint, I, I was thinking of what should I, uh, I put in my outline. And uh, probably not everyone knows very well or very familiar with the SDG 12 or SCP. And to think of some simple uh, uh, outline topics, I just make it why SDG 12, which I will explain. What is SDG 12? Because <clears throat> not many people have really come across SDG 12 uh, thoroughly. Uh, where are the SDG 12 entry points? Yeah, it can be uh, wide in scope, but uh, there must be some easy uh, entry points. Sometimes we call it the low hanging fruits. And how to measure SDG 12 when SDG 12 evolved and uh, the, and then I go into the main of this uh, presentation, which is also the SDG 12 in response to COVID-19, which is the current pandemic. And of course, that is not 90% of the discussion because the first part will already uh, go uh, uh, occupy 50% of my discussion. And then uh, I don't think I will have uh, much time left, but there is a very important uh, message coming from uh, the International Res uh, Resource Panel wherein I'm a, a part of it uh, to uh, release uh, uh, an important document uh, during the pandemic in 2020 called uh, Building Back Better. Uh, and there are several pointers and I'd like to share with you, go through quickly some slides and invite you to visit our websites. <clears throat> the, 
pointers given by IRP was based on more than 30 um, global uh, resource technical reports and manuals published by the IRP uh, covering all 192, 193 country data. So that would be a very good uh, reference if you go into uh, uh, data mining. Okay, so my first question is why uh, SDG 12? If you will look at the SDG, there are 17 SDGs, 169 uh, uh, targets and 240 uh, indicators. And um, why, why did I choose, why do I choose uh, uh, SDG 12? Well, if we will look at the report of the United Nations um, SCAP, which is the headquarter in, in Bangkok for Asia Pacific, uh, report on the last year on the SDG progress. You will see that almost all other uh, SDGs or the goals have somewhat uh, a positive progress in the region from 2015 onward until 2020, because it started in 2015, it's a 15 year uh, midterm, um, global midterm uh, uh, target or uh, pro, uh, development goals, except uh, on number 12 and number 13. SDG 12 on uh, consumption production, SDG 13 on climate actions have a uh, retrogression instead of a progress. And it also carries uh, a striped uh, color over there. What do they, uh, what do they mean? <clears throat> First of all, in terms of progress and regression, it regressed, okay? Then second, they are in the striped uh, color because there is insufficient indicators. In other words, uh, from the uh, primary data and secondary data uh, obtained by the uh, research uh, community uh, from Asia on, on the Asia Pacific uh, 60, there are 68 Asia Pacific economies, uh, member economies under the UN SCAP. Uh, it means that there is a significant lack of, uh, of data available or indicator data, uh, which is also translated to two major questions. First question is that if we talk about, uh, for example, number six, it's on water and sanitation. We know, we, know, we know that we go to DNR for the Philippines, which is the Ministry of Environment. Uh, if we talk about number seven, affordable and clean energy, we know we go to DOE, which is the Ministry of Energy in the Philippines. Or number eight, decent work and uh, economic growth, we know we need to go to uh, 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 DOLE, which is the Ministry of Labor, and also the NEDA, which is the National Economic uh, uh, Development Agency. But when we talk about sustainable consumption and production, there is no such central or a line bureau or line agency or line ministry in almost all countries, except Brazil, of which one of our colleagues is present uh, representing Brazil. I met the Brazilian minister on sustainable cons on cons consumption and production uh, to, uh, a few years ago. Uh, that is the only country that has a line bureau on uh, consumption and production. And uh, no other country or no other national government has uh, set up such a ministry alone just for consumption and production. To some extent, uh, the Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Agriculture, and the relevant ministry in the Philippines uh, um, uh, context, uh, we have uh, in the cabinet level, we do have a sustainability uh, cabinet cluster. So these are the interagencies looking after the sustainability issues. And therefore some relevant ministry may set up offices or programs or, or projects on sustainable consumption and production. Now, those are the only uh, venues where in SCP data can be collected. And sometimes they are not uh, complete. So that is one reason uh, in my personal opinion as a researcher. The second uh, uh, reason for the lack uh, of uh, or the significant lack of data is that uh, the indicators, which is the way of measuring uh, the, the performance of SDG goals and targets uh, put under the SDG 12 or SDG 17 goals. Uh, I think there are 13, if I'm not mistaken, 13 uh, indicators. Uh, they are not uh, available or they are not used or they are not introduced at all 
in uh, many uh, in many of these 68 member economies in Asia Pacific. Uh, just to give them a good example, resource management and resource um, efficiency, we talk about what is the recycling rate, what is the uh, material footprint, what is the material flow accounting, and I don't think these are uh, uh, well collected data and also well computed and presented in any primary data bank or secondary data bank in many uh, national government agencies. So uh, in lieu of this, I think uh, that presented uh, such a picture in this uh, 17 goal uh, chart. And unfortunately, I saw it. And uh, I, I think uh, instead of uh, targeting all the other uh, topic first, I feel that the first uh, lecture series should target SDG 12. And I also see that other topics mostly are thematic in place that they target specifically on water, either the water source or the other side, which is the water pollution, which is the receiving or the, the source or the receiving or the receiving body. Or we talk about um, the, uh, the land, we talk about the energy, uh, but the consumption of production is a pattern. And a pattern is just like a strategy. A strategy is where you reach A from point A to point B. It can be a science, it can be an art, and it is sometimes quite abstract. So um, it is a cross-cutting goal. And this, this goal cross-cuts actually seven, eight, or even nine other uh, SDGs. So that uh, highlights how important the uh, SD, SCP or SDG number 12 is among the 17 goals. So the people are polluting water faster than the nature can recycle and purify and excessive use contributes to global water stress. Energy consumption continues to rise and each household contributes 20, uh, almost 21%. Let me organize my, my, my pictures here, okay. Uh, 21% of the resultant carbon dioxide emission and overconsumption and production of food generate food waste due to oversupply uh, and disposal issues. As we know that one third of the food uh, uh, goes to waste uh, in the global uh, food uh, value chain and uh, which accounts to 30% of the world's total energy consumption as well. They only, not only carry the material but also carries the water footprint and water and the energy footprint and 22% uh, and of the total greenhouse gas emissions. Now to this day, further degradation is happening and it is expected to happen in the for, uh, foreseeable future. I'm presenting to you a uh, decoupling picture. Now consumption and production of resources worldwide rest majority on the use of the natural environment and resources. Now this in turn produces adverse effects on the planet and to this day, further degradation is happening as I said in the previous slide and it is expected to happen in the foreseeable future. And to solve this problem, uh, resource and impact decoupling should be supported to promote the sustainable consumption and production. And in order to have a greener and more socially inclusive global economy, what we would like to happen and to see is that, uh, the, well, not, not only the we, I'm, I'm referring we as the, the, the member economies of the United Nations would like to see is that there is a continuous positive economic growth, but not at the expense of the resource and at the expense of a negative environmental impact. So uh, the resource use must be uh, carrying a lower positive slope, if not neutral or negative slope. And while the environmental impact would be good if it has a <clears throat> negative uh, slope, meaning that they are either partially detached or they are uh, completely absolute uh, decoupled from the economic activity. But that also at the expense of uh, human uh, well being or uh, uh, quality of life. That is uh, the goal of the explains the goal of the uh, sustainable development. Uh, I try to do some literature review this morning. Actually, this is the latest uh, uh, search of Scopus this morning, around uh, half an hour ago, uh, before I come up to the to, to the to the web to the Zoom. Um, I was thinking that uh, because I have been so familiar with SCP 
uh, in my uh, association with uh, working on several UN projects back in starting in 1997. Uh, so I, I come across, I came across a CP through those UN projects, but um, after that, uh, I, I involved in writing our our output of the project programs and and and, and share them in the journal publications. But uh, I, I did not really do a initial search of when these sustainable consumption and production came across. So I tried to investigate if uh, SCP came from the academic <clears throat> community, research community, or it really come from the political uh, community. And uh, uh, a quick search uh, uh, reconfirmed that uh, the term sustainable consumption and production uh, did not come from the academic and the research community, actually. Uh, well, of course, it may stem up uh, from the uh, uh, scholarly minds, but it has been discussed among the think tanks in the various economic uh, clusters, such as OECD, um, in the later part of, uh, in the early days of the European Union, but but since, uh, since Euro was only introduced also uh, not, not that early in 1990s yet, and uh, maybe part later uh, in the United Nations. So actually it started in UN around 2000, but it has been mentioned that the kind of cons consumption pattern was unsustainable. The kind of uh, production uh, pattern was also unsustainable in the early days, even during the 1992 uh, summit. Uh, a search on the Scopus showed that uh, only a book was uh, produced uh, in, or published in 1997 with no other name, but I checked on the abstract, it did mention OECD. So it was it stemmed up from the discussion in the political uh, entity or institution. And uh, from 1997, 1998, similar discussion evolved a little bit. And 2003, Guido Soliman, who is uh, uh, who was uh, already a member of the United Nations Environment Program, uh, he was hired mainly to promote SCP uh, from the 2000-2001 period, uh, uh, evolved in uh, in uh, in a journal. So that confirmed me that uh, SDG 12 uh, uh, of quite origin is somehow uh, uh, from the. Uh, uh, from the international political uh, entity. And uh, in, in, instead of going back to the original definition, probably we should use the latest or the most evolved definition. And it was quite coined well in the SDG 12 uh, in 2015 uh, resolution of the United Nations uh, SDGs. So SDG 12, which is a reliable, a responsible consumption and production instead of using a sustainable consumption and production. Uh, it, uh, it comes out with the uh, states, uh, three important uh, objectives to ensure the goals are to ensure the sustainable consumption and production patterns and to ensure good use of resources, improving energy efficiency, sustainable infrastructure and providing access to the basic services green and decent jobs to ensure a better quality of life for all. And uh, it has 11 targets under the, uh, the, 12, uh, the 12th goal, uh, which covers eight targets and three means of implementation. And there are 13 uh, in indicators uh, put under this uh, SDG item. Uh, all the member states of the UN are uh, welcome to make full use of all the 13 indicators or 11 are targets, but of course they are flexible also to adapt and align it to the local scenario. So they are not obliged or they are not mandated and it is uh, not a binding uh, agreement. So it's a non-binding um, initiative. So the countries have some flexibility uh, to use part or all of these targets and indicators. If you will look at the definition, it. Uh, uh, it, it sounds it's uh, really uh, covering everything because it's really a process, a pattern. Uh, from a system engineering and industrial engineering point of view, it looks quite simple to us. Uh, we would just have, uh, we just use a similar system thinking uh, approach and the uh, simple framework I present here. It is uh, an input, throughput, output, and a uh, output approach, wherein we have resource input, 
and the resources can include not only material resources, energy, water, human. Uh, in the in, in the industry in general, we call it also 4M, the man machine uh, methodology and uh, and uh, and man machine methodology and methods. And uh, output can be product and non-product. And of course, uh, when we deal with this, uh, uh, the goals identified by SDG 12. We also need to deal with the input side, wherein we look at conservation of resources. That's when it mentioned highlighted resource management, and we also look at the resource efficiency. So both are very important uh, uh, parameters we need to take care and highlight. And of course, when these are well uh, paid attention to, that brings and leads to several of today's uh, approaches and initiatives that includes shared economy, uh, 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 the substitution of, uh, of products by uh, uh, utility function, which is service. So that evolved into product service system, uh, share economy, uh, uh, and um, a reduction of, by, uh, of, uh, of byproduct, which is reduction of emissions in the form of uh, liquid, solid, and um, air and gases. I will not go further into that uh, because those are uh, tackled in our uh, mm, graduate school topics. One of them is uh, tonight we will be discussing, we have a one and a half hour lecture on the material flow accounting in my class. So uh, also that, uh, that is a, uh, a simple approach, uh, a system kind of thinking approach. Um, we, we, we do uh, follow uh, what are the, uh, what are the uh, entry points? Because it may cover so much and uh, it may cover almost all the industrial sectors. It may cover agric sector, it may cover service sector. And uh, for the SDG uh, 2015 to 2030, 15 years, uh, there are some priority areas. And therefore there was an agreement uh, to, to focus first on the eight targets. The first target is uh, to implement a 10 year framework program, which I will discuss later. And the second one is sustainable management and use of natural resources to half the global per capita food waste, responsible management of chemicals and waste, substantially reduce the waste generation, sustainable corporate practices and reporting that evolve into GRI, global reporting initiative for most people coming from the private sector, uh, sustainable public procurement, because we believe that um, public uh, procurement versus the private procurement that cover all the green purchasing issues and marketing, uh, that in many member states, uh, the government or the national state companies uh, do purchase uh, almost 30% commodities of the 30 of the entire national commo uh, commodity market. And such a uh, influence may uh, leverage the um, that the cost of production of such a, a green product or a environmentally uh, environmentally friendly product, therefore uh, reduce the cost and economy scale, reduce the cost and bring the price of the green products apart with the uh, with the uh, pro other products that are using virgin material, and therefore we will be able to promote uh, sustainable consumption from uh, from that point of view and uh, promote universal understanding and uh, of the sustainable lifestyle, which is uh, an important area that involves psychology, behavioral sciences, social sciences, uh, researchers. Now, on the 10YFP, that evolved sometime back in 2002, during the Rio plus 10, uh, I was present in, uh, in Johannesburg uh, to present to the uh, ministerial uh, uh, meeting of the European Union on the concept of industrial ecology, especially more specifically on uh, industrial symbiosis. And during that meeting, there was an agreement in the, uh, in the 193 member states of the United Nations, wherein they will be having a, a complete consultation, bottom up complete consultation for each continent on the priority areas of, of SCP. And therefore uh, each of the uh, priority areas were ranked accordingly. Most of them come up with energy, water, uh, fresh water availability, etc. issues. And, it, and in 2012, which is the Rio plus 20, and that it finally closed, 
uh, the, uh, the, the cycle of the uh, Earth Summit uh, converted the, uh, the, the Marrakesh process, which was the process of consultation, into a 10-year framework uh, program for implementation of those uh, uh, sustainable consumption and production priorities. Uh, the Marrakesh process, which you saw in this picture, uh, covers the, uh, some of the main uh, 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 thoughts. First of all, the life cycle thinking that is the most important heart, that is the engine of the, of the Marrakesh process, uh, considering also the enabling policy framework from the government, the market forces from the uh, private, private sector, technological in innovation, and also the lifestyle or the uh, values and lifestyle of the uh, consumer. So uh, that constitutes the, the Marrakesh uh, concept and uh, the 10 YFP enumerated a list of uh, priority industrial sectors. Uh, and you can go to the website of the United Nations Environment Program uh, to see more, um, more information about that. Uh, the three means of implementation uh, that follows the eight targets are supports the developing country scientific and technological capacity of SCP. Uh, that includes, I think we have some colleagues from the Indonesian uh, Cleaner Production Center also are uh, present here. Uh, some uh, National Cleaner Production Center were, 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 were initiated and in some countries also they have the SCP focal points and SCP uh, centers uh, established mostly established by the government or a kind of a public-private uh, initiative and collaboration. And a second one is to develop and implement tools to monitor sustainable uh, tourism. And the last one is to remove the market distortion that encourage wasteful consumption that includes uh, a necessary or um, encouragement of uh, or Those are uh, some of the some of the, uh, the the possible entry points. Not during these fifteen years uh, efforts of the United Nations in their discussion. And of course, speaking of the tool, uh, this is the one important tool wherein we uh, use the system uh, framework I presented to you earlier. Uh, furthermore, uh, operationalize it so that uh, each of the elements can be enumerated and therefore it can be used as an important tool for material uh, accounting. So we will be able to really check the resource use and the resource that, so that we can manage the resources. And uh, of course it has been uh, developed uh, much earlier by the ecological economist, economist and then it has been adopted by the industrial ecologists and we have been using it in several of our publications and this is also the topic of my classes uh, tonight and if we have uh, if we do those uh, material flow accounting accordingly then we will be able to draw many several uh, uh, output and the data output will show us if uh, the gdp versus resource use are partially decoupled or not, or, or absolutely decoupled. This was an early work uh, the, uh, presented by uh, Marina uh, Kowalski in her European Roundtable for Cleaner Production. Note, it is that the time in 2001, uh, it was still called cleaner production and not yet uh, evolved into sustainable consumption and production yet. So she has uh, presented uh, several of the uh, uh, OECD countries uh, 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 decoupling pictures. And that also drive uh, many of the ASEAN and the Asian researchers to, to, to draw a picture for the uh, Asia, uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, picture of these decoupling uh, figures. And it has been uh, published um, uh, about, a half, about a decade ago um, in one of the publication uh, uh, collaborated by UNEP, CSIRO, and other colleagues. Uh, I would like to share with you now uh, a little bit of the uh, of the timeline and what happened overall uh, through the entire evolution. Since I uh, uh, was quite lucky uh, that I joined this entire uh, roadmap. So uh, before 2000, of course, a lot of consumption and production pattern were unsustainable, has been uh, discussed, deliberated, and mentioned several times in several international meetings. Uh, 
But uh, until 2000, somehow, somehow uh, from 19, late 80s, early 90s to 2000, cleaner production was the focus point. And at the turn of that, uh, those years, uh, cleaner production has been more on the supply side. Uh, it has been very successful in improving the production process and also in the uh, product design using life cycle assessment, uh, input output uh, extended, uh, environmentally extended input output system was also uh, freshly introduced uh, uh, along early 2000. So LCA was the main tool at the time for the eco design and for a large system, we use material flow accounting and we use footprint. Uh, that time was mainly on uh, ecological footprint and then carbon footprint, water footprint were uh, softly introduced uh, in those 1990s and to early 2000 uh, in Asia Pacific region. And also from my experience in uh, uh, touching the European counterparts and uh, all those um, uh, improved uh, progress in cleaner production led uh, to, uh, to some uh, important uh, uh, achievement. And that achievement uh, provided a complacency of, from the consumption point of view. And the consumption or the consumer market seems like, okay, if the product is not green and environmental friendly, probably we can consume more. So the absolute emission, uh, emission and the absolute impact, negative impact on the environment or on, on our life support system, which is the ecosystem, uh, is increasing. And that we call a rebound effect. And through several network discussion, as I said, in the 1990s, the National Clean Production Center were supported by the UN through the donor uh, countries. And um, uh, they form a United Nation National Clean Production Center network. And also they have a counterpart in the civil society called the uh, regional or continental cleaner production round table, where in the Asia Pacific have the Asia Pacific round table for SCP or CP at that time. I was, uh, I became one of their past president in 19, uh, 2000, early 2000, uh, in the late 2000s. And then the European round table for SCP, the African round table for SCP and the United, uh, the US, uh, or the American uh, Pollution Prevention Roundtable, or the P3, not the P2, sorry. And um, those uh, network met almost every once a year or every 18 months. And then the global level, we have a high level cleaner production uh, meeting every two years, where in the output of the region become the input to the global. And then people learn from each other the success story and also learn from each other the barriers. And we call that time the untold story so that they will avoid those failures. And during the turn of the century of 2000, the rebound effect uh, created this, um, this, this thinking or uh, invited the thinking wherein uh, if increased a sustainable consumption of those green product. So that is a green consumption. However, they are not sustainable. So consumption of green product is a unsustainable consumption. And therefore, probably consumption should be also brought into the big label so that the involvement of evolution of a, of a cleaner production to sustainable consumption and production came into the picture. And SCP uh, became the, the, the official term adopted uh, under the UNEP uh, program. Uh, ba Basta Liu, who is now the uh, CEO, COO of the uh, World and uh, World Resource for, uh, Forum uh, was also hired by UNEP at that time. And also uh, Guido Soneman, who, uh, who uh, published one of those early paper, is also, uh, was also hired by the UNEP to handle this new program called including the sustainable consumption. And uh, LCA now also have a very important role to play because it will provide the consumer, inf uh, consumer the inf information of uh, their smart and cons uh, sustainable consumption pattern. And uh, on the other side, the UNIDO, who is a uh, partner of UNEP in promoting cleaner production, also continue on their industrialization mandate. And they integrated the other, uh, many other works of the cleaner production, including energy efficiency, energy audit, cleaner production audit, eco-innovation, et cetera. Although eco-innovation is also partly joined by UNEP in their, uh, in their initiative. And they created uh, all together with UNEP a new, uh, network called the RECP, we call it the RECP, which stands for resource, resource and efficient, uh, resource efficient and cleaner production. 
and um, Indonesia Clean Production, uh, National Clean Production Center, colleagues who are present in this seminar today, is also a member of the RECP net uh, during those years in, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was sometime in 2010 to 2018. And I served as its regional executive for one term. So that was the evolution from CP to SCP to recipe net, but SCP stands alone very uh, on the light in the limelight. Why? Uh, it goes back to the uh, to the uh, to the Earth Summit and the um, uh, Sustainable Environment uh, Sustainable Development Summit. And uh, as I mentioned in 2002, that was the Rio. Ten years after Rio, we call it the Rio Plus Ten uh, at the Johannesburg. Uh, Marrakesh process was introduced to consult. And um, during 2010 and 2011, which is the 18th year and the 19th year after the Rio meeting, uh, the uh, every year, all the countries also meet in uh, New York uh, headquarter of the United Nations. And we talk about what are the new initiative, uh, uh, if, if the initiative in the land binding agreement were uh, enacted as a law in each country. And then the, uh, the up year on the 19th year, we talk about uh, how were those laws or enacted were implemented successfully or not so successfully. What are the barrier and success stories in other words? And it was on the 19th, 1819, uh, there are the five final lists of the um, theme. The last list, number five, is on sustainable consumption and production. And actually that completely wrapped up the 20 year process of the uh, Earth Summit of, on, on sustainable development. And therefore sustainable consumption and production indeed is the final theme of almost number five, the last theme of the uh, CSP 1819 and uh, that, that, that wrap up. And that's why uh, SCP was so, so important because it cross cuts many other issues and that became an action plan. And that action plan is put into 2012 Rio plus 20 10 year framework program. Uh, following three years after 2012, uh, of course, the, 20, uh, the, the, the Rio plus 20 ended up uh, the 20 year cycle of the, of the Earth Summit and uh, it evolved uh, or the discussion continued and it was put under another UN uh, entity called the High Level Political Forum, which you can see in 2018, uh, HLPF, which I will explain later. But uh, three years later in 2015, it was also about time to change the global uh, development goals which um, called an end to the 2000 to 2015 uh, Millennium Development Goal, MDG. So therefore 2015 to 2030, <coughs> SCP <coughs> is so important that it occupies one single goals by itself. As you can see, many other goals is a combination of several goals all combined together, but SDG 12 has only SCP alone. Uh, SCP was reviewed again <clears throat> in the 2018 High Level po Political Forum, uh, and 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 we do, I'm sorry. Okay, and we do give a, uh, a thorough discussion on that. Now, uh, just I'm not going to discuss this. And this uh, here are the six areas where the 10 year uh, 10 year forum uh, framework program 10 YFP. Uh, covers and you can go to the website of 10 YFP or One Planet um, UN for more information about the program and priority areas. Um, so we did uh, get involved very much. Actually, the La Salle University is proud to say in 2009, which is at the um, at the eve of the CSD 1819. Uh, I'm I'm the uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think yes, I led. I'm the lead author. Of the, of the background paper on SCP for as input for Asia Pacific to the CSD 1819. And, uh, oh, sorry, it should be 1819, not 1920, because there's no CSD 20, there's real 20. And uh, what happened here is that uh, in that meeting, uh, we had a proclamation of green economy uh, launch by UNIDO in the Philippines, where in uh, 45 minister came to Manila and we took advantage of that event to uh, invite the expert from these countries to stay an extended day. We bring all of them to the La Salle University 
And then uh, we had an expert group meeting chaired by me and uh, the, uh, the, the commissioner or the secretary, Lucille Sering of the Climate Change and uh, from UNEP by Arab Hobala. And in 2018, we also organized the, uh, through the Asia Pacific Roundtable, the uh, high level political forum in, uh, in New York. Uh, I think I need to wrap up in about 10 minutes. So I will be entering, um, entering the, the, the response and that will take around eight minutes time. But before I leave the uh, definition of, um, before I leave the, uh, the, the SCP uh, complete discussion of SCP, uh, uh, you may go more further into discussion on the academic and research side. Uh, I, one of my latest uh, uh, ideas uh, were, was just published a few months ago with my colleague, uh, our organizer here, uh, Professor Aviso, uh, and our vice chancellor, Professor Raymond Tan, and our uh, brand new doctor, Jonah uh, Bakilias, who just got her doctorate degree two days ago on Monday. Congratulations, Jonah. Uh, and uh, uh, or a few years ago, we also connected the um, uh, circular economy industry 4.0 to this SCP uh, with my uh, colleagues, uh, also an alumnus, proud alumnus of the La Salle University, who is now based in Taiwan, Chair Professor Ming Dong Cheng. Uh, and also, uh, we also look at uh, some uh, energy and material flow of mega cities that covers global view published in the uh, PNAS. Uh, earlier publication, uh, probably in year 2013, uh, in Journal of Clean Production, we also look uh, just focusing on Asia, or even much earlier, I think I had a uh, 2002 publication, but that time, uh, we still do not have very clear picture of SCP, so we just have a sustainability uh, theme in general, which I published with my colleague from Finland and uh, uh, Maryland uh, colleagues. Okay. Now, let me go uh, use my last 10 minutes uh, to touch on the uh, 10 to 15 minutes to touch on the coronavirus or the pandemic. Uh, also this morning, uh, I, I look at, uh, I, I also search on, online on some, uh, on some of the pandemic issues. Of course, the pandemic impact uh, clearly, of course, the number one impact is on the health issue. And uh, this morning, I just uh, got the latest update, but actually this is updated in the website uh, of uh, American Time, I think this. So far, uh, 100 million people had, uh, had uh, uh, come across this uh, uh, impact and more than 2 million people, uh, two million, more than 2 million on the 100,000 death toll. Um, over these years, uh, the, the frontliners, we salute to them, their work and uh, different government uh, come up with the uh, uh, several measures. And uh, these are some of the early days uh, estimates of the, how to uh, reduce, of course, we cannot totally remove the impact, but how to reduce the impact through lockdown and uh, protective gears. Uh, another important, um, another important uh, factor here is the, on the economic impact. Um, just in time to uh, to to meet the um, the Davos meeting, which was uh, uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, the Oxfam uh, report came up with the economic inequality report on on Sunday, last January twenty fourth, three days ago, ahead of the meeting, and um, and also ILO presented uh, how the workplace closure uh, uh, brought to work hour losses and labor income losses. So nine months, that's how long it took the world top 1,000 billionaires to recoup their fortunes after the coronavirus pandemic hit. And more than a decade is how long it could take the world's poorest to recover. Now this uh, deep divide between the rich and poor is proving, is, uh, is really proving uh, as deadly as, uh, as the virus. Meanwhile, the wealthy are generally weathering the COVID storm quite well. Um, though the stock market collapsed in the early months of the pandemic, they have rolled back. And thanks in part to the unprecedented, uh, unprecedented economic assistance provided by some national governments. Uh, I, sometimes I wonder if they are rational subsidies. Uh, if they are like, if there are more than five or three airlines, why should you subsidize all the three airlines? But of course, that is my personal opinion. Uh, 
Worldwide, the wealth of the billionaires has grown by $3.9 trillion between mid-March and the end of December. But the number of people living in poverty globally could have increased up to by uh, 500 million last year, according to the uh, UN studies. And uh, that is a uh, very dangerous sign. So I want to uh, come to our uh, uh, to the environmental issues. No? Uh, to the, for the environmental issues, shift a little bit. I think I have to remove this for a while. Ah, okay, good. All right, so uh, about the lockdowns, which I just presented earlier, um, the lockdowns uh, increase the demand for online procurement and home deliveries of food and other necessities, leading to significant growth in organic and inorganic waste uh, generated from household. And I got a lot of uh, input and technical information from the paper published by Professor uh, Raymond Tan and uh, his colleague uh, Yiri, and that's one of the top paper in the year 2020 uh, of the high citations, one of the highest. Uh, online food purchases increased by 92.5%, and for the other product like masks by 44.5% in the Republic of Korea, and demand for online shopping has also increased in Vietnam by 57%, India 55%, China 50%, and which resulted in the proliferation of single-use plastic as packaging. And that also give way, the um, environment give way to somehow to the health issues. Now, in addition, Well, in, a, in addition, hazardous biomedical waste uh, have become even more prevalent following global demand for PPE, such as face masks and gloves. Overwhelming existing medical transport and disposal infrastructure around hospitals. Uh, Asian Development Bank with headquarters here in Manila projected that more than 150 tons of additional medical waste would be generated per day in some cities in the uh, Southeast Asia. Frequent hand washing was advised, uh, bathing, cleaning, and disinfection of surfaces produces a significant amounts also of wastewater to be treated. In addition to that, the excessive use of disinfectants such as sodium hypochlorite also has uh, very harmful effects to the wastewater treatment systems. On the other hand, the pandemic has caused most of the world to live with a restriction to mobility. Hence, major industrial sources of marine pollution, such as industrial wastewater disposal, crude oil, um, and heavy metals have uh, decreased a lot. Tourism activity, which involve the use of marine and coastal environments, such as boating, uh, have also uh, been suspended, not to mention uh, cruises. Uh, that's what I'm referring to here. Uh, because of this, an improvement in surface water quality in terms of uh, suspended particulate matters, SPM, is expected. How unfortunately, over the uh, from the uh, from the quick recovery and uh, close, a uh, very quick uh, recovery or a quick recall of these uh, bands, okay, have uh, generated again um, additional or additional impact back into the uh, back to the ecosystem. On the energy demand, in addition to decline in incentives for the uh, renewable energy development, may cause a serious reduction in the renewable energy investment and uh, efforts, and a further delay in the achievement of the global climate goals, while some workers in the sector have been dismissed or suffer from the outbreak. Now, the pandemic also disrupted the supply chains until today and caused delays in the construction of renewable energy projects. A procurement of equipment, production of uh, solar panels, as well as problems with the customer acquisition. Several shifts uh, can be noted in energy consumption. Uh, as overall electricity demand decreased in Australia by 6.7%, uh, India by 26%. There has been a significant decrease in commercial and industrial load demand, uh, while a substantial increase in, is observed in residential load demand. Energy demand for private transportation increased due to private car use up to 40% for fear of transmission, and whereas the use of public transport declined by almost 80% in the early stages of the lockdown, and it's still ongoing in many parts of the uh, lockdown area, for example, in uh, Metro Manila, uh, in NCR. 
uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions from transportation were reduced as, by as much as 2 million tons per day in 18 countries in the Asia Pacific region early in the year uh, 2020. Now, what we do is the, using a feedback loop uh, as presented uh, by some author in this journal uh, article has been conceptualized linking the deforestation and COVID-19. And this explains how zoonotic uh, diseases, public health, economy, agriculture, and forests are linked together. And deforestation and urbanization and utilization of ecosystem must shift towards a more sustainable design and system once to prevent future pandemic outbreaks. Natural resources, energy, and materials need to be used efficiently and circularity promoted to prevent environmental degradation. Final few slides. Now, while these short-term uh, while these short-term measures may have halted the sustainability transitions happening around the world, long-term recovery plans can still bear the opportunity for sustainable growth through investment in circularity and free art. That's why UN calls for a building back better uh, uh, calls and, and, and programs. On the waste management, insufficient solid waste management system open up to potential rampant -tum dumping and uh, open burning and incineration in that in turn could affect air quality and pose health risks. Now the pandemic also increases the risk informal the workers are involved in the solid waste management. And these are the scavengers and the lockdowns have significantly affected the recycling market, resulting to decrease in the demand for recyclable and causing some hindrance and barrier to the circular economy uh, initiative in some uh, major countries. And most of these uh, recyclables were sent directly into a disposal in uh, uh, in afraid of uh, contamination. Now most economies are still on a linear growth path and that is heavily reliant on extraction, uh, production, consumption, and then uh, complete disposal, uh, which makes them vulnerable to biodiversity loss and environmental degradation. Pandemics will continue uh, to arise in the future without measures that uh, address the unsustainable path of development. Integrating the principle of uh, circular economy, which is using SCP, can help prevent the future emergence of infectious disease. On the climate change, this uh, pandemic revealed that economic activities are still very much all coupled with environmental impacts. As economies begin the, to forge a path of economic recovery, we can see uh, principles of circuit economy and SCP can be used as a tool for climate change mitigation and crafting a more resilient economy, which is uh, listed in the uh, annex, which I will share this uh, PowerPoint with you, or you can just go to the uh, website of International Resource Panel, uh, wherein we, we, we lay out uh, a complete set of, uh, uh, of strategic options uh, based on the data, global data uh, from the uh, 30 uh, uh, global technical reports. And uh, some regional response from Asia Pacific point of view uh, is uh, strengthening regional supply chains and easing regional barrier to trade of essential goods such as uh, green corridor. Now this will prevent delays in pandemic response, including the vaccine cold chain logistics and fostering the regional uh, commitment to a green recovery. Uh, this commitment can take many forms in Asia Pacific region, including technical cooperation among countries, public private partnership, research and development and regional funding mechanisms on green industries and green skills enhancement. I also look at some of the salient tertiary and senior high school uh, components in the region that we may look into collaboration among ourselves. On the national response of each country, uh, adaptative, adaptability of uh, infrastructure and response for sustainability by governments and industries existing production as a facility will be helpful. Ensuring access to water and sanitation for all and several countries have already begun to develop economic packages. And uh, I hope they are properly uh, 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 aligned to the uh, 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 new green deal, such as this new green deal term we use as uh, 10 years ago during the, uh, the, the recession time. Uh, at the local level, rethinking rural and urban development with respect to ecosystem boundaries and carrying capacity because they know best in their local scenario and circular local economy based on uh, resource flow and value chain. 
And uh, this kind of capacity building is very important. If not, they can get uh, assistance from the national government uh, to do the ma proper material for accounting, to do the proper life cycle assessment, to do the proper environmental impact assessment, so that um, a, 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 a strategic local, um, local uh, plan is uh, scientifically designed with evidence-based approaches. Now, the National Research Council of the Philippines and NAST have been very proactive these past months, providing a lot of seminars and even going into the region where Professor Alvin Kulaba is uh, initiating several Visayas region uh, projects. Uh, we will hold that under the Future Earth Philippines program in February. So. Uh, with that, uh, I am somewhat uh, completed my, uh, my presentation, but just to sh show you, this is the annex, and please download um, the document from the International Resource Panel, uh, which is currently chaired by the two former minister of, uh, uh, of European Commission and uh, Brazil, uh, Isabella Teixeira. Uh, they pro came up with several um, uh, pro, uh, uh, op uh, policy option and strategic options, uh, which are science-based in natural resource use, uh, economic development, waste, environmental impact, and innovation, uh, covering construction, agriculture, food industry, and transport using the data uh, collected and published in the uh, global uh, international, uh, global um, technical reports. Uh, we presented the footprint study, the simulation, the modeling, and uh, they will be very, very helpful, uh, including some success story in different uh, countries and uh, material flow uh, analysis output and results. So you can see material efficient vehicles and housing, resilient and resource efficient cities, resource smart food system, and land restoration, etc. Uh, at this point, I'd like to thank my colleagues in De La Salle University for inviting me to this um, uh, maiden uh, uh, lecture series. And also thanks to my current class. I have uh, three sections uh, miss, uh, in the graduate school of, uh, for both master and uh, doctoral program from the industry engineering and uh, biology department. Thanks to them uh, in um, early part involvement of some uh, desk uh, research and preparation of some beautiful PowerPoint slides for me. And good day to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Anthony. I think you really... Um, it's too long, sorry for that. Yeah, I know. I, I, no, but I mean, the coverage of the topic is uh, really, um, it's really scope, uh, it's really wide in scope. And it's not, it's good. It's, we're very fortunate to have you here with us since you've been with this particular program since the very beginning. So I'd like to invite the audience, if you have any questions, to please feel free to type it in the chat box. I know that um, uh, you probably have a lot of questions for our speaker, and this, we can take the time now to discuss some of those um, questions. So while they are still thinking about their questions, maybe I can, I can start it off. So maybe you can share with us, Anthony, what are some of the best practices that you think um, should continue uh, to be done so that we can achieve more sustainable um, lifestyles. Thank you. <laughs> lifestyles. Oh, lifestyle. When we talk about lifestyle, people think more of luxurious lifestyles. And, <laughs> and, and I just want to share that uh, I have a difficulty sometimes to, to, to judge if I should accept a paper uh, submitted to one of my journals. I will not mention which journal. And if it's if it is about uh, uh, luxury, luxury goods, and uh, and if you will see that uh, in the uh, means of uh, implementation of SDG twelve, it does say uh, we should avoid and uh, and discourage or. Uh, the unsustainable lifestyle and sustainable consumption pattern. Uh, should we judge that luxury goods are unsustainable or sustainable? And 
Uh, but they said, well, in the luxury goods industry, we also, the products are more durable. And also they are saying that uh, we do have a corporate social responsibility, uh, but okay. But, but I think uh, it will take another group, good group of uh, research community to uh, evaluate and uh, the, the, the environmental or the sustainability impact of those uh, of the sector in, in, in the global economy or global setting. Uh, another uh, often asked question is about private jets. <laughs> uh, many people said, Anthony, when you represent uh, the Philippine government uh, delegation in the United Nations, could you please uh, highlight why are all the monarchies uh, using private jets? And while well, they are uh, talking about sustainable development, but they are flying in their private jets. That's also not sustainable. Uh, so these are some uh, very, uh, very political and sometimes very um, challenging question to ask. So if you will ask me what are the best practices, uh, I would not rather use the best practices as the first step. I think the first step is to have a local uh, scoping and uh, mapping exercise. So we need to use global uh, mindset, but we have to uh, take a look at our local setting or local scenario. So a good mapping and a uh, scoping exercise on your local scenario is important so that you know what are the areas of, uh, of priorities and, 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 and improvement needs. And that calls for uh, normally three area. One area is uh, where an area that has a high impact like uh, energy, the uh, high demand for energy or high emission of uh, pollution or pollutants. And uh, another one is the high consumption of material or material intensive uh, acti uh, activities. Now, all these three uh, are probably you may say that they are all upstream production issues, but don't forget producer is also a consume, a produce, producers are consumers of natural resources on the upstream. And the consumer also has the role to play <coughs> Uh, the, the consumer of the end product, which was uh, discussed in our paper, uh, Professor Avisa, if you recall, uh, is that the consumer at the, of the end product uh, also have an influence on, on the choice and therefore the producers need to meet their choice. And that has been discussed also in another uh, topic called the strategic, uh, strategic uh, operation strategy. Uh, Initiated by the Harvard School, uh, this, uh, school, uh, school of School of Business, uh, School of Thought. Uh, so therefore, these three high impact area impact on uh, material use or resource demand, high impact uh, due to energy demand, and also high impact due to emission or or environmental negative impact should be given the priority. After you have uh, identified this area, then then the next step is then you look at the production and the consumption side and then look for a benchmark. What, what will be the best practices around the area? Now, what I want to say here is that uh, there is a uh, discussion that uh, what, how come um, the uh, Western or the North Hemisphere research community focus more on uh, consumption while the uh, North South Hemisphere or the developing uh, community focus more on the production. Now it has something to do with the uh, uh, resource use. Uh, from the International Resource Panel uh, 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 publication, we noticed that um, in the developing world, most of the consumption or the uh, natural resources were consumed in infrastructure building, capital investment. Uh, machineries, etc. So, therefore, uh, most of the research are focusing more on the uh, on the production side, and therefore, producer as consumption consumer of natural resources prevail here. While in the uh, northern hemisphere or with the uh, uh, OECD countries, uh, uh, most of the material consumption lands in their uh, household consumption. That's why consumer product and consumer uh, attitude, consumer. Uh, behavior uh, becomes also a very important uh, uh, focal uh, fo research focus, and uh, they also very much love to pre to uh, to to preserve uh, their the heritage, and therefore not much disturbances on uh, on, on new infrastructure, etc. As we can observe, so uh, this partially uh, differentiate uh, the research as well as the 
um, uh, best practices we just asked. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I have a couple more questions. So the first one comes from Ray Montan. So thank you so much for the comprehensive inaugural talk. The world seems to be locked into unsustainable consumption patterns because of entangled vicious cycles. Can you give your thoughts on key steps for us to begin to break these vicious cycles? Hmm. Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, the, the, the good thing is we, we know that this is a vicious cycle. And therefore, we came up with the decoupling framework or the decoupling concept to guide the people on how to get away from that. Uh, of course, we are open to other thoughts. That is very important. Uh, using the decouple thoughts or the idea, uh, we, we develop a, or we introduce the closed loop approach of resource use, and therefore circular economy eventually um, came into the limelight. And that's one way of uh, moving away from this uh, vicious, vicious cycle, uh, wherein emissions accumulates, wherein undigest, indigestible consumption prevails, and uh, and uh, and also on the um, the, the on, on the consumption behavior uh, on the consumption behavior studies. Now I, I I am calling the first two more easily handled because they are scientifically and scientifically and physically easier to control. Uh, as I introduced in our paper called the uh, Pokayoke uh, approach, a sustainable Pokayoke in, uh, concept. But the last one, which is on the behavior side, uh, it is very tricky. Even social science can determine uh, or can describe the behavior, but we cannot uh, prove that how effective a measure can, can shift the behavior from negative to positive or from unsustainable to sustainable. And just like the, the vaccine, how long does the antibody last? Meaning to say that if a unsustainable behavior were shifted to a sustainable behavior, how long does it last that it may revert back to unsustainable behavior? So uh, because that is another, uh, I would call a, a very important uh, a very important uh, influence factor on the on the reason why vicious cycle uh, was uh, was formed. So uh, there's no one scientific answer because it involves not only physical, natural, and uh, applied science, but it also involves behavioral science, social science, and including psychology. Psychology. Thank you for that. The next question comes from Ricardo Ruiz. So good morning. So a question is on UN World Tourism Organization. They have identified three tourism SDGs, numbers 8, 12, and 14. Do you think this is enough considering the situation today? Uh, as I said, SDGs are priorities. Uh, it took, if I'm not mistaken, it took almost 10 years no, to, to come up with 13 SDGs. So uh, the original plan is to have a single digit SDG, meaning not more than 10, uh, not more than nine. So only nine, not 10, so that it will be easier to remember. And if, uh, if so many international lobbying uh, uh, entities uh, are, are influencing this uh, final output and therefore 17 was the uh, final uh, SDGs, 17. And uh, to, to, to reduce or to minimize the confusion or to, to, to make it as simple as, as straightforward as possible, you should not, uh, we, should not uh, be, we should not be producing too many uh, sub levels. And, and I, I think uh, these are meant to be priorities. Uh, same as I described SDG 12. Uh, I tried to put a 
academic or a theoretical uh, uh, definition of that that could cover everything. Uh, yet uh, the political agreement, just remember SDG is a political agreement. It is not a uh, political agreement based very much on the scientific community, but of course they also listen to many other communities. Thank you for that. And Dr. Kebenko sends her congratulations Thank for you. the first uh, lecture. Yes, um, and we're hoping to have uh, continued uh, participation also from our audience in our upcoming lectures. The next question comes from Christina Kayamanda. So please, plastic waste also increased during the pandemic. How can we control its increase as well as maintain sustainability of the economy and the environment? I think that would be a thematic issue rather than a, a uh, I think if we want to save uh, to solve the problem in the same within the same time frame, uh, it would be extremely difficult because it is a fight between environment and life. And between the two, of course, I think life <laughs> is very urgent. Of course, environment eventually is our life supporting system. Yeah. So we can see that uh, government who are the regulator of this uh, or protector supposedly of these environmental laws, which was already in, in, enacted in many local LGU or local government units have to relax a little bit and allow uh, plastic, sink, uh, plastic use. And little by little, it's balancing, uh, such as economy and environment is also given the first top priority to balance because that involves poverty and hunger. So as you can see, even in the SDG, the, the first few of these SDGs are poverty, hunger, etc. Okay, so uh, no life, uh, there's not, nothing to talk about. Uh, Earth will not disappear. <laughs> It's only the human species. That's yes. why sustainability is about uh, how to protect human species. And well, from human research point of view, of course. Uh, and when we look at all of them as a life support system, and uh, of course they are care for other species, but I, I, I believe from, a, from my observation that it's still human-centered uh, scientific uh, goals. And therefore, uh, poverty, hunger, these were given priorities. Now, of course, uh, if you talk about plastic, there are so many um, solutions, uh, yet uh, technical, technological solutions are present, but political decisions are made. And we have to remember that, again, SDG is a political uh, agenda, and they have to consider and balance other dimensions. Um, Future Earth Philippines uh, has a strong uh, plastic cluster. Uh, I think academician um, Tyrit uh, Fabian is, uh, is also one of the lead uh, authority in this field and uh, several LaSalle researchers in our, in our community, including the global LaSallean community uh, could uh, come together and uh, work on a plastic uh, issue because uh, after the uh, greenhouse gas issue, uh, plastic comes into the limelight of the political um, uh, political platform. Thank you for that. The next one comes from Chris Crispian Lau. What role should oh, stakeholders? Crispian. Yeah. What role should stakeholders play, and how can we get them involved? Uh, strong leadership. Uh, I would say strong leadership under Crispian Lau. <laughs> uh, Crispian, <laughs> Crispian uh, is our proud Lasallian uh, alumnus, and he is the uh, commissioner on this uh, uh, on, on on this issue, and he also represent. Uh, I, I understood that he also created a network of uh, of these uh, plastic uh, issues, and actually he's. He's managing uh, overall municipal solid waste. Uh, I, I know Crispian now uh, for, for, for a long time. He, he represented our country in, all, in several UN uh, summits and UN high level meetings, uh, thanks to his leadership. How, to, how do the stakeholder play an important role? I think number one is a good leadership is needed. Uh, the, Everyone is so proactive and want to play a role. However, sometimes 
they play a role without proper orchestra, uh, or someone orchestrating it. And therefore, uh, a, a strong leadership like Christian or someone should step out and, and, and come up with a, a very visionary, implementable, uh, doable, strategic action plan so that people would follow. If, if you re remember in March 15 of 2020, so many people would like to donate the food to the hospital, yet there is no central coordination. And some hospital may receive three sets of lunch per capita, and some hospital may receive none. So therefore, coordination and coordination, uh, coordination is extremely important. And the right action plan is important. And I believe, uh, uh, again, they, this is not a venue to discuss how to design those uh, uh, and analyze what kind of uh, what what stakeholder should play what role. Uh, this is uh, this we have all the expert in this room, and uh, I think that that is the most important step. Yeah, right Thank action you. plan, right leadership. Thank you for that. The next question comes from Sheep Kionza. So, Dr. Chu, in your opinion, do you think the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly SDG 12, will be achieved by 2030? Thank given the current situation? No, of course not. Uh, we are now 2021. It's already uh, one third, more than a third. Uh, and that's why they, they assess it during the high level political forum. And in 2020, the the, UNTA, uh, sorry, the, the UNS Cup, uh, the first slide that I presented earlier, already showed that there is a uh, regress no? rather than uh, progress. And in fact, there is no uh, lack of indicators. So I think there are there is a need for the governments to to put the proper indicator or the measurement the the, the metrics proper metrics in place in the national uh, national metrics, and um, and then from there you can move on because if there's no data, there's no management, and and I think we all understand that. Um, now, what if we can, what, what about we cannot achieve it by 2020, but uh, I think uh, at this moment, especially when we meet where we are, we are met with this pandemic, I think we have to, to make sure that we are still driving in the right direction instead of going to a wrong direction or in the opposite direction. Uh, that would be the minimum um, expectation. Uh, I, I, I personally don't think that we, we can achieve uh, all those goals, but those goals are a good target for to lead us uh, toward a good direction. I'd like to uh, acknowledge another important uh, scholar, uh, researcher in the room, uh, Biswajit uh, Sarkar yeah, from Korea. He has, he has also a question. So yes. maybe we'll take, this is the last question. Yes. Um, <laughs> so thank you for the SDG 2030 planning, but is it possible to establish the green mobility within the SDG 2030? If this type of pandemic will yes. come again, how yes. the sustainability will solve this particular issue? Uh, yes, uh, mobility. So you talk about uh, low carbon mobility, you talk about uh, low carbon mobility. If you talk about low carbon mobility, we're only targeting, if you remember, I used the SCP framework from a system point of view, the input, the throughput, the output, and the round put. No? So there are four puts there. Uh, very, very basic to analyze. So if you talk, look at the carbon issue or low carbon issue, that's only one of the, uh, one of hun a thousand and one issues of the SCP that involve into the gas use emission that comes out from the system. And one of the gas is uh, greenhouse gas. Okay, so if you will look at that alone uh, from a mobility point of view, of course, it's only one program under the sustainable mobility. Uh, it involves many things. Uh, the, from the energy source, that's one. Uh, from the material, uh, like uh, lightweight versus heavyweight, better uh, uh, better curve for uh, fluid fluid uh, dynamics. Of course, those all, all those things uh, will cut down the consumption of uh, of fuel for mobility. Another way is the way we uh, uh, we we move around. Okay, so infrastructure if. Uh, if everywhere is a, a, if point of work and point of residence is walkable, then there's no need for uh, demand for mobility. So urban design, urban planning, uh, that was another uh, important in Brazil. There are several good cases on uh, on this, and um, uh, 
uh, another another approach is uh, uh, for example the re recycle or if you can avoid a certain uh, material use or a fuel use maybe you can capture them etc well, of course uh, carbon capture or is is, is 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 already there for several years now all these things uh, uh, just bring it down, not to to low carbon mobility. Uh, oh, of course, what another way is uh, uh, we must thank this pandemic for creating this new normal. Uh, after the, the pandemic, I hope very soon. Uh, I believe uh, important events, uh, conferences may be hybrid, meaning that the important people or the core group may really need to go to their physically because they need more physical interaction. But the rest. Uh, maybe they have a choice. No? You attend a conference because you go there and you dine there, you spend more money, or higher costs, so you have to pay higher registration. But if you don't go there, uh, you can just attend a meeting and present your paper over Zoom. Uh, maybe you would, you would be given a lower, uh, lower registration fee uh, option. And of course, the benefit is still the same in terms of intellectual uh, interactions, no? getting feedback from the audience, etc. Uh, of course, people would love to travel and see the world. Uh, so there is a uh, trade-off among different social, environmental, and economic uh, 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 issues. Now, that, that, uh, that ends uh, the, the, the low carbon mobility issues. Now, another issue is uh, uh, sustainable, sustainable mobility uh, is way, way beyond uh, low carbon uh, mobility also. So there are many other programs under sustainable mobility. Uh, we, we, I, I understand that uh, hybrid cars and um, uh, electric cars uh, are also getting much more popular. Uh, it is a system change. It is not just a singular or vehicular change. You need also charging station and charging station is getting energy from the uh, fossil fuel uh, power or, or fire, fire uh, powered uh, power plants, or uh, is it coming from just a localized uh, uh, solar energy, uh, local grid, community local grid, or a solar energy panel uh, charging station that also makes a lot of difference. Again, if you look at the uh, uh, solar panel, what is the life, uh, life, uh, life uh, cycle of the solar panel? At the end of its life, do you will you be able to recycle and reuse those solar panel, or it will become a uh, uh, a terrible environmental impact uh, to the ecosystem if they are if they reach end of the life. So this whole thing has to be uh, uh, done by the research and scientific community. And yet, uh, I, I do not think that with the quick evolution of these uh, uh, thoughts, system change, product change, service change, attitude, behavior change, and choice changes, uh, they they will eventually um, uh, evolve into a final resultant impact and it is important to see what is this resultant impact. Now resultant impact covers not only environmental impact but also the social impact. So uh, how to integrate social dimension into life cycle assessment is another big challenge, although there are some initiatives like in the early days when Walter Footprint was introduced to uh, to annex or appendix the uh, ecological footprint and uh, carbon. Okay, so, thank you sorry for a long answer. Always, <laughs> thank uh, you very much, Professor Chu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, there are actually a couple more questions, but unfortunately, it's already 9.30. But perhaps for those who ask the questions, you'd like to stay behind, and we can maybe perhaps discuss a bit more with Professor Chu. Sure. But I would... Let's have a small uh, panel, yeah. uh, small, small chat, uh, informal chat. I, I, will, uh, I, I think that would be more fun. Uh, and, and remember, uh, come and visit Philippines after the pandemic. Uh, more fun in the Philippines. Uh, <laughs> Is that but, still our tagline? <laughs> but I hope uh, not too much uh, carbon footprint. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, I would I will need to close this particular webinar, but for those of you who would want to stay behind to, to chat with our speaker, please feel free to do so. I'd like to invite everyone for our upcoming um, webinar. So we intend to have these webinars on a monthly schedule on the last Wednesday of each month. So our next schedule will be on uh, February 24. Now I have a copy of your email addresses. So if you want to get um, 
email not notifications. I will be sending those uh, via email. And like what Professor Anthony Chu said, um, I'll be sending a copy of the PDF um, uh, version of his slides to all those who are watching together with a link to the YouTube recording. So you can always go back to it if you want to hear more about the discussions. And with that, I'd like to close this forum. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, uh, yes. I, I will stay until 10. So okay, I'd so like to the... yeah, invite some good friends, so the Biswaji to stay and somebody to stay if they can. All right. So thank you, everyone. And for those who want to stay behind, please stay behind. Thank you and see you guys next time. Bye.